uh, you know, uh, I think I found the biblical era uh, where Paul said, uh, uh, Christ came to save sinners of whom I'm chief. I think uh, I'm the guy, not him. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. Gotcha. <laughs> My point is, is that Paul said that he was the chief of sinners. And I'm telling you that I don't know if I can, disp- I might be able to dispute that because I think I'm the chief of sinners. I think we all have fallen short. We all have come to a place where um, we realize just how desperately we need Jesus. How, how de- and I think that's where Paul was at. I think he said, you know, and Paul had a whole lot of good works. He had a whole lot of things he had accomplished in a very, very short period of time. I mean, the man did three missionary journeys all over from Europe to Middle, to Middle East, three in a lifetime, without Uber, without taxis, without airplanes. Uh, uh, you know, the man just covered some ground. And still he summed it up and said, you know what? It's only for Jesus. You know, and, and uh, you know, I, I uh, wanted to... Uh, one to share tonight on a topic that I think I could share anywhere. You could too. You can go anywhere, anytime, pretty much any time of day, as long as there's some waking hours behind you, and talk about this subject. It's called forgiveness. You know, and, and the, th- the reason why you can talk about it because I mean the day's still young. If you don't have an issue where you need to forgive someone or you you uh, you see uh, uh, some issue on the area of forgiveness, uh, that means the day's not going. Either you just woke up. Uh, because there's always something going on with that, right? We can always talk about something. Maybe it's been in the ministry. It could be a relationship with a brother. Something came up where, you know, he, you know he's got your socks. You know, they, those, those are one of a kind pair of socks. You know, you know he did it. You know, he messed up your laundry or whatever, you know. Or he ate your uh, ego or whatever. Um, you know, we always, we can find something that we'll have need of forgiving somebody for. Don't you think? So this is a safe topic to talk about kind of any time. You know, any time that we're breathing. And, uh, and I wonder, well, you know, why did God make this so laborious in this area of forgiveness? Because there's one element in true forgiveness that always is included. Him. It brings us to a place where we, to have it truly happen, for it to truly be successful forgiveness, it has somehow some connection to the cross. Would you agree with me on that? Yes. You know, and, and uh, I mean, you know, people... I don't know if you ever been in a in a room where you know you you want you know something happened and uh, you just want to get out of there, you know. Excuse me, please. I got to go. You know, whatever. Um, I think that sometimes we approach God with the, in the area of us asking Him to forgive us or pardon us when we talk when we talk about ourselves. Because you know, there's that area of us God forgiving us and then us forgiving others and ourselves. It's almost like we're we're really not asking God to forgive us. We're asking Him to excuse us. Yeah, you know, you ever feel that tone sometimes? You know that we're asking God to excuse us, and and I now I I've, I've come to believe this in recovery, and, I, and I'm going to talk a little. I don't want to talk too much about me, but I want to share a little bit of my testimony. If that's okay, just to tell you where I come from with this area of forgiveness. Uh, but you know, I do I do think that that um, uh, you, you know forgiveness is a perfect way to to be free of all kinds of things. But the number one person that I need to be free of is me. You know, I, uh, there's nobody robbed me like I've robbed me. There's nobody lied to me like I've lied to me. No one's stolen from me as much as I've stolen from me in my lifetime. And uh, no one's done the harm to me as much as me. Would you, would you guys, you know, if you can't agree with it, just give it time. You'll figure that out. <laughs> okay, it's going to happen. You know, because what we realize is that you know, there, there's, there's a. Uh, there's two kinds of ways we go with this. One is excuses. The other are reasons why we find ourselves in the need to forgive others or to forgive ourselves. There may be a reason why we need to forgive. And, and there may be a reason why we're holding back forgiveness, that we're holding back not forgiving. And, and uh, that reason may be a, a legitimate reason. Maybe we truly have gotten hurt. How many, of you, how many programs have we been in here? Let's say, how, how many of you have been in more than three programs? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you have been in more than five programs? Three hands. Okay. How many of you have been in more than um, seven programs? Raise your hands. Okay. I just had y'all lie to me because you've not been in those multiple programs. You've been in facilities. You've got one program that's called Life. This is the program, Life. 
you know, that's your program. And you showed up at facilities and they helped you out. Uh, probably, you know, you go back and go, I wish I would have listened to those people. I wouldn't be here, you know, this time. Or, or whether you're in a program or not, some of you I realize are not in a program per se, but you are in, in, you are living, aren't you? It, pinch yourself here and see, make sure you, you know, you're okay. You're in a program. It's called life. What happens in that program? You know, it's called life. Are you alone? See, if it wasn't these darn people that come into my program, I'd be okay, right? And, uh, you know, if you've lived long enough, you, you're going to find that uh, it's easy to, uh, to counterfeit forgiveness and end up actually stockpiling things that are going to be very harmful in your life later down the road. Now, I don't know if I'm the oldest person in here. Uh, you know, I'm only 29. I know this ministry's been really rough on me, okay? <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, but I do know, I have lived long enough to realize that, that uh, you can't be in this program called life at any length of time and not get hurt or, offend, or offended. You know, uh, I remember years ago, uh, you know, I started several ministries, and when I'm, when I'm uh, you know, I call it my, my uh, Ishmael that I created. And uh, that's when I barreled my chest out and showed God how to start a program. And I learned some things from that. Uh, but, you know, I remember going to Brother Mickey down at Dunklin and telling him, man, do you don't believe these people are saying about me and they're talking about me. And he just starts laughing. And I said, Mickey, you're not making this easier. You know, why are you laughing? He said, because I have a, I have a scripture for you. And he opened up the Bible and he went to a red letter version where Jesus spoke. He said this, beware when men speak well of you. In other words, Larry, are you looking for the approval of man or are you looking for my approval? See, so you got to start there with forgiveness because if you realize that that's the, that's the launch point you're at, that your whole, whole thing is uh, not, accept, not trying to get acceptance, you're operating from acceptance. Uh, what my pastor, uh, I have a pastor up in Atlanta called Louis Giglio. I go to Passion City Church. And uh, Louis had this great teaching one time on forgiveness and acceptance, love and acceptance. He talked to, he, he ministers to the Olympic swimmers, is what he does. He's like a coach, life coach to him. And he, uh, he made sure he told them this. He said, listen, when you get there to launch and you're ready to dive in the water and you're there getting yourself ready, waiting for that start gun to go, just remember that you're swimming not for acceptance. You're swimming from acceptance. You're already accepted. You know, that's truly receiving the forgiveness, isn't it? That's really basking in it, kind of owning it, you know. Well, then what happens to us, though? Because even though that's true, and biblically that's true, I can, I could, you know, uh, debate that biblically to be true. Uh, theor theoretically, it's true. Then what is our problem? If we're already accepted, what happens to us? Anybody? What's the breakdown? Hmm? Fear? Okay. What are we afraid of? If we've been hurt and we know that certain things hurt us, uh, do y'all remember the scene in Lion King where I think it's the, the monkey, whatever his name is, uh, you know, I, I'm, my, my daughter would now be horrifically horrified and embarrassed that I don't know the name of that monkey, okay? <laughs> right now. But uh, I don't even know the names of the lion. We are the, the lion and the, the monkey, you know? But uh, you know, he, he said he, he, he swings at the uh, Simba, whichever one it is, and hits him in the head with the stick. Remember that? <laughs> then he swings the second time, and Simba ducks. He says, see, you can learn from your pain. We don't duck. <laughs> we get bopped in the head, and it's almost like we, then we become addicted to this, this drama of unforgiveness that goes along with it. And our human nature, the flesh, kind of gets off on that for some crazy reason. I don't know why. And guilty. You know, I, I don't know if it's some kind of sense of power I feel like when I have something over someone's head that, that they've offended me, they've hurt me, and you know, back, you know, they owe me. Uh, because truly, unforgiveness is simply debt collecting, correct? I mean, I'm just collecting debts. People owe me. I want you to close your eyes for a second. I'm just going to do a little quick inventory here. <clears throat> All right? And, uh, <coughs> excuse me. And, uh, uh, I want you to close your eyes, and I'm going to just say a little prayer, and then I want you to, to uh, do what I tell you, okay? I promise I will not come, you close your eyes, buddy. I promise I will not come and thump you on the back of the ear. Now, Dave Cox, he's back there waiting to come thump you on the back of the ear, but I'm not going to do that to you, okay? So just trust me. Let's close our eyes for just a second. Lord, uh, we all have a list. 
of debts. There's people that have, that owe us. They owe us, whether they owe us an apology, whether it's financial, emotional, spiritual, relational. So Lord, right now in the name of Jesus, give us that list. I want you to just make a mental list real quick, just in your mind. Let me know when you got three or more and just raise your hand. Okay, all right. Open your eyes real quick. Uh, <clears throat> how many of you had, had more than three? Okay, all right. Who, who's on your list real quick? Just so you don't have to give names. Just who are, who are, who's on your list real quick? If y'all say Larry McKenna, I'm really going to struggle here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. who, who is on your list? Friends. Friends? <clears throat> so, okay. Uh, group of friends or one friend? You know, group of friends. You know, I, I have this belief that I do not believe the devil is in the details. I think he's in the vague and obscure. I think God is in the details. We need, in our forgiveness, we need to be targeted. Because it happened targetedly, didn't it? Those words, we kind of, they kind of still hang in our head and hang in our minds. They're, they're still kind of hanging there, right? So it's a friend. And we don't need to name him, but it's a friend. Okay, I got this other question that i got to ask you. How many of you had yourself on that list? Yeah. One? No, you didn't? No, you're saying yes? Okay, you got to raise your hand. because I, yeah. I know that. Well, actually, that is a universal language, yes. <laughs> I gotta, I'll go with that. Um, but uh, so, so few people really put themselves on that list, especially people that are struggling trying to work through a program. Because what are we still doing in some levels? Still beating ourselves up, correct? Mm -hmm. Some of us have the gospel thing down, you know, and all. And so now for, for you ladies and you people that had raised your hand and said, yes, I put myself on the list, uh, you remember a time when that was not easy. If you've forgotten, Lord bless you, <laughs> you'll probably have another lesson in that because I think we never should forget the cost it certainly was free, but it certainly wasn't cheap. And what it took to get us to a place to truly forgive ourselves and take ourselves off that list. Cancel the debt we owed ourselves. Uh, you know the old story, everybody brings up the scripture usually in Matthew 18 about the, the unjust steward, right? You know, the, the guy that uh, owed uh, the master of somewhere like, uh, was it $8 million, something like that, something like uh, in gold, it would have been something like $8 million, right? And he went to the, the master, called in the loan or the, the debt, and said, uh, All right, it's time to pay up. And he said, he, he, you got to remember these words. He said, Master, have compassion on me. All that I owe you, I will pay you back. That was his words. Master, have compassion on me. All that I owe you, I will pay you back. Now, I may be paraphrasing a little bit. Some of you. No, it actually has two more words on there. Don't, don't get crazy on me. That's what it says. And then, so the master's moved with compassion, and it says that he cancels the debt. Now, if you owe the IRS a bunch of money, and you got a letter, you know, you said, look, I would, I'm asking that you would cancel this, this IRS debt I have with you. Would you all please forgive me the debt and let me move on with my life? And I promise to pay my taxes from here this book there forward to pay my taxes. And they said, yes. Would you, would you question them? No, I don't really believe you, man. You know, <laughs> you, know you get a letter from the IRS saying that all your debts are canceled. You have zero balance. Uh, I don't believe this. You would never do that. You would be jumping, woohoo! You'd be uh, throwing a party, you know, hopefully not a, one that included drugs and alcohol. But you would have a, a heyday, a celebration, right? Mm -hmm. But when it comes to forgiving ourselves, we have the hardest time. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. And, and, and though we're, we could be talking about addiction, we're really not talking about addiction. We're talking about us. You know, uh, I was a, uh, I was born into a, a, an Irish family, and uh, my grandmother was from Belfast. Okay, that's what I heard. Our great grandmother, sorry, and uh, this this is the root. You know, when you do the lineage thing, you know, this is the kind of stuff you find out. But anyway, my dad, my dad uh, was a, a great man, but he was an alcoholic, along with all the other McKenna males. You know, I think his father was an alcoholic as well. And so, you know, I, I kind of, I'm the last of eight kids. So, um, you know, my, anyway, my dad was Catholic, okay, Irish Catholic. And my mom was Baptist, and, which made me want nothing to do with any of it. 
And uh, I was a rebellious teenager. I grew up in the, uh, you know, I know y'all can't believe how old I am. But I grew up in the 60s and the 70s. And uh, at age 12, I figured out that, you know, I could actually play guitar. I get some attention. And uh, saw my buddies playing guitar. I said, well, they give attention too. So I decided to play a bass. So I got into a band playing the bass guitar and set into a whole life of drugs and you name it. You know, uh, the, the, the sad part of it is we never got famous. You know, <laughs> we were broke. We had just enough money to go buy the dope we were getting high with or whatever. But, you know, and, uh, but the garage was a great concert hall for us, the garage band. <laughs> And, uh, but anyway, I'm kind of exaggerating, but, but, uh, but it was, you know, music was my life. And uh, so but my dad was Catholic, my mom was Baptist, so that means I was a, a Baphlic. I came up with a new denomination, I'm a Baphlic, you know, and uh, so when I, when I got saved, I decided, well, you know, mom's usually right, so I'm going to go to the Baptist church. I'm going to find the biggest Baptist church in Savannah, Georgia, where I grew up, and uh, I'm going to go to that biggest Baptist church, and I go there, and, and uh, it's if you know Savannah, it was called Bull Street Baptist Church at the time. And uh, so I went into Bull Street Baptist Church. It was 1974. And I sat down, and they asked me to leave. And I said, well, I just got here. And they said, yeah. And I'm thinking, well, the service is open. It's just like me to be late for a church service, you know, or whatever. It was my first church service. And uh, no, they said, no, it's a shame for a man to have long hair. You're going to have to leave. This is back in the day. And so I left, and I went to this place called Forsyth Park. Anybody know where Forsyth Park is in Savannah? And uh, this was the hippie age, so, you know, uh, I had these guys over there playing guitars. I saw a bunch of chicks and guys over there having a good time playing the guitars and singing and stuff like this. Uh, and, and I said, well, there's some people I can relate to, you know, and I'm going to go over there. And uh, I know that you're supposed to share this gospel. See, I was, I was saved in a little jail uh, called um, Tybee Island uh, where uh, – uh, Months, month before that, my keyboardist that uh, played the band with us, I, I ticked him off so bad, uh, you know, because I hated Christians. I just kind of persecuted him a little bit. And, something. <laughs> and uh, got him to a point so mad that Johnny, who was his name, he grabbed me by the collar and he put me up like this and said, but Ken, I remember this. Jesus, I'm a sinner. Forgive me my sins. Come live in my heart and let me go. And I said, what a freak. You know? <laughs> Until three or four weeks later, I'm in the jail looking at that metal mirror, you know, at a kid that was 17 years old, just getting ready to turn 18, and I looked 95. I was so lost, and I remember Jesus, I'm a sinner. Come live in my life. Come live in my heart. Forgive me of my sins. And he did. I was shooting heroin. I was doing L dropping LSD every day. For, I think my 12th birthday, I dropped. I celebrated with an eight-way hit of LSD. You know, and I grew up in a band. People around me that were a little a couple of years older than me, so uh, you know that's where I got all my hippie fineness. And uh, um, so, and Savannah was just there. Really, was nothing else to do but use drugs and drink. So it, you know, that's what I did. And uh, so, but anyway, I met these folks in the park. These other uh, hippies. And I started sharing because I knew, I, I read up until John chapter 15. So I got that far in the gospel. I know you're supposed to read the Bible if you're a Christian. I, I got that part down. So I actually started reading and I got to John 15. So I go and share the, with these, these, these uh, hippies. Uh, let me tell you about Jesus. And, and I was so clumsy and, and they started laughing at me. I said, man, this stuff's hard. And they said, no, we're laughing because we're Christians. Oh, yeah? Yeah. And there I entered into the Jesus People Revival. I went from Savannah, Georgia to Oregon and down to Costa Mesa, California, where I became part of a ministry out of Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, California. Chuck Smith became one of my spiritual daddies. And, uh, and I got discipled, became a pastor. 11 years clean. 11 years clean, I have back surgery. And, and uh, within two month period, my dad dies of Hodgkin's disease. I have back surgery. My wife has to move on a hospital bed and I can't walk. I, I couldn't walk for months. Uh, it moved the hospital bed into our home. And then also my best friend's wife uh, died uh, bearing a child. At, she had placenta percreta, if you know what that is. And she died bearing a child, bled out. All this happened in a couple of months. And so I found that the pain pills that the doctor gave me for my back also medicated the other hurt too because I bargained with God. You see, God was supposed to heal my dad of cancer. God wasn't supposed to let my dad die of cancer. 
my dad was Superman. You know? So I just, I'm just telling you this because let me tell you where my end at that point started. I was angry at God. I had an expectation. God didn't meet it. Isn't that the definition of anger? Unmet expectations? Mm -hmm. And what does that lead to? Unforgiveness. And it was from a hurt. Who hurt me? I perceived God hurt me. I prayed and prayed and prayed. Did God heal my dad of cancer? He, he's the toughest man I know. If anybody can beat cancer, my dad can beat cancer. And he didn't beat cancer. Cancer beat him. The only three years that he was sober, he was dying of cancer. Now he did give his life to the Lord. Became a believer. My whole family got saved, actually. Including the old man that I was involved with. So, but I just could not let that go. God, you, you, you killed my dad with cancer. So I ended up in this place, you know, about seven years later called Duncan, you know, and uh, when I got in there, it was November the 3rd. I remember it was November 3rd, 1992. You know, some of y'all may be born then. Uh, but, uh, you know, 1992, and, um, you know, the rest of us were just being denial of it, you know what I'm saying? But uh, 1992, it was, uh, uh, it was on a Tuesday. Now, I don't even know what happens every four years on a, on a Tuesday. What, there's this election called the presidency. You know that? Okay, this one was on, on, on November 3rd, 1992. The Braves lost the World Series. Clinton was elected into office, and I went into rehab the same day. Okay, so I remember the day I was accepted into Dublin Memorial Camp. Okay, now I got the better deal. You know, still sad about the Braves, but uh, you know they did they did hold they did dominate a whole decade, right? Yep. So uh, <clears throat> anyway, I'm just sharing that with you to tell you that that's what got me to to Dunklin. But then when I was at Dunklin, um, am I doing good on time? I like a man that doesn't know what time it is. Am I doing good? Okay. Uh, but when I got to Dunklin and got to my point of inner healing, where we did this lesson called grieving. <clears throat> uh, I kept hearing this noise back behind the inner healing trailer. It was a backhoe digging. And I asked my teacher at the time, well, what's, what's that? Said, oh, we're, we're, uh, we're going to have a, a Colonel Dave Lyde passed away, and we're going to have this memorial service right after class, and all of us are mandatory to go there. I said, well, I don't go to funerals. Because the last thing I did as a pastor was bury my dad, and I quit. I flipped God a bird, honestly. When I say, you know, oh, that, you mean figuratively. No, I mean, that's where I was at. I was so hurt. And, and held God responsible. You know, look what I've done for you, God. I served you all these years, 11 years clean. I could have been out partying like everybody else, you know. What was I doing, you know? And, uh, and I, remember, uh, I remember being in that inner healing trailer, and we were supposed to make a list of losses we were to grieve, right? Now, you all know that, that grieving and forgiveness and, and all these things, they kind of go together, right? You know, sometimes we're not forgiving because we haven't really grieved the loss yet. We haven't really released people and things. So, so it's kind of hard to forgive them too, right? Including ourselves. Like, like for example, our old life and our addiction. Some of us have not given up on our right to our addiction in our old life. Really happened. Uh, you know, uh, I, I love the guys in our program say, Larry, I'm done with all that. And I look back at them and I tell them, well, it may not be done with you. Hmm. So you need help. And we need each other. We need the Lord too. So uh, anyway, so I found out that I said, well, what, what did he die of? He died of Hodgkin's disease. How old was he? Colonel Lyle. He was the same age as my dad. Now, how can you figure that happening? What are the odds of that happening? That this man died of the same disease my father. And I'm here supposed to grieve the loss of my dad. And I had six things on my list of grieving. The top one was my dog Asher. He's my Alaska Malamute. He's my pack dog. You know, he's a big bred from the Kinsey River Wolf. He's a, he's a bad dude. He's my dog. I had him 13 years and he died. You know, so I had him on the number one loss. My dad was at the bottom because I had somehow connected that if I truly release my dad, then I'm going to be forgiving God and getting God off the hook. I didn't say that out loud, but that's kind of the way I was navigating life. You get what I'm saying? And so, but anyway, comes around to the bottom line is I canceled the debt with a lot of people. Uh, I forgave God. I told God, uh, I don't know how to forgive you. 
And he said, finally, something you will admit that you don't know how to do. Now I can do this. And so I had a vision of my dad. Now I don't, I don't talk to dead people, so don't get freaky on me. You know, uh, you know, um, you know and uh, even Jesus is alive, so you can't, you know, anyway. But, uh, so, but I had a vision of my dad and it was kind of, you know, anybody ever been in the snow in the woods? I hunt, so uh, anybody ever been in the woods? You know that insulated sound it has? It's kind of like, you know, insulated sound. There was that there present. This all just happened in seconds. And I saw my dad in my little, little headshot of my dad. His face was fully flushed, good color. Last time I saw him in the hospital, he was shriveled up like a skeleton dying of cancer. And God showed me. He said, Larry, I've got him. Now I want you. I broke. It opened up doors for me to forgive some of the craziest things people have done to me by learning that forgiveness towards God. Stop blaming God. Stop blaming and start accepting. You know, uh, um, I, believe in, I believe in reasons, but I don't believe in excuses. There are reasons for things, and I think God had a reason for that. I wasn't ready to truly surrender my life back over to the Lord. The Lord used all those scenarios around my life to bring me to that place of brokenness to where I would truly release God and then let him truly work in my life. Because once I did, I, I basically untied God's hands in my life, per se. Then I found that all these other people, it's like this. Let's say there's God right here, right? And Larry's walking this way, going this way, right? And God says, Larry, repent. And we know the word repent is a nautical word. means turn about, right? So I turned around. I started going back towards God. But what I realized is all these people I left in, his way, in my wake. Surely I'm going back to God. But I, I don't see, when I turn around, these people that I hurt, that have hurt me, the relational peace that's going on. Because all I was looking at was running as far away from God as I could. And if I turn to repent, I'm going to run to God as fast as I'm going to act, right? I'm going to do it all wide open, right? But there was people in my wake. They didn't just disappear. My uh, wife, uh, when she used to do groups with me, uh, I remember I was sharing one time in a, in a similar overcoming event. It was called, it's a, it's a, called an Addicts Victorious <coughs> group. I was sharing, yeah, uh, we, we kind of just, yeah, guys, uh, I was in my addiction, and when I got to Dunklin, it was like waking up from a nightmare. And she pipes up and goes, yeah, but I was awake the whole time. That time that I was anesthetized or numb, she was awake and aware of all, so she was taking the hits. People in your life have been taking hits, guys. You know, uh, I don't say that to beat you with, a stick to beat you with. I don't say that. I say that to give you reality. And it's going to take some time. It's going to take some effort. You know, addicts are weird. We, we, there's two things we want. We want to be trusted and we want to feel normal. Those two things are the main things we have to go after. And, and uh, what about the trust issue? Can anybody, in, in you guys in the program, do you feel like you've earned all your trust back to everybody out there? Uh, you know, uh, they got to see some proof of life, don't they? Okay. And you judge a tree by its fruit. But do you want to be trusted? Isn't it your desire? If I could just get them to trust me, then, then it's all real. Well, you can't trust unforgiveness in any form. Because it leaves us open to the demonic. It leaves us open to uh, more hurt from people. It doesn't matter if you look at the spiritual side of it or the physical side of it. Uh, physically, it's been proven that, uh, medically, it's been proven that forgiveness produces a lot of healthy uh, things in our life. Right? So, <clears throat> then what's our problem? Today, has there been someone that you could say, you don't have to call them out because they may be sitting here, but th th that you got offended by today? Did anybody here get offended today? No one here got offended, but okay, you got good, okay. 
like me and you, buddy. <laughs> We're alone people here. <laughs> so uh, now, if you did, if you need to come up to Atlanta, I'll just ride you through Atlanta traffic, and you can get some people that you can forgive. Okay, <laughs> it won't take long. You know, especially if you're on a motorcycle, you, you, your near-death experiences will bring you uh, closer to God for sure, and forgiveness. Um, so, but when we stockpile unforgiveness, how does it? What kind of people does that make us? In our nature. Hmm. I can't hear you. Okay. Stop stockpiling unforgiveness. Like you know, we hold on to grudges. Grudges. Yes. Yeah. Bitter. Okay. Huh? My bad. I'm just bitter. A bitter? Okay, please. Yeah. Okay. Um, what? Someone else said something. Angry. Angry. Yes, angry. Yeah, angry. Um, how how long do we stay angry when somebody offends us? Let's talk about recovery for a second. How, how long? Let's say if you stay angry at somebody for an hour. I mean, how, how long does it take you usually to get over being the reaction of being angry? Anybody? Hour. Hour. Usually the stand. So, uh, yeah, okay, I know this is not something you think about every day, okay? But let me just tell you how important this is for your recovery. When you're angry for an hour, how long does it take you to go get high? If you left right now, how long would it be before you were using? If you wanted to use? Within an hour. Ten minutes. Ten minutes? So look what anger does to us. Anger opens up that, and that unforgiveness opens up a window of, of relapse for us. It's very dangerous. That's why it's so important to work on our anger and our unforgiveness. It's critical for your success and recovery. You can't do it without it. Because there's going to be that one time that's going to roll around in your anger that you're going to act on. It. You're going to respond to it. It's going to hook you right in. I'd say every relapse that's in this room represents... How many of you ever relapsed before? <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, sometimes I question if we ever lapsed. But uh, how many of you worked the first three steps and relapsed? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Pew. I mean, some of you just don't even go. I, I don't even believe you can relapse unless you work the first three steps. Because that's about, in other words, you're not giving God really you. So for you to go out and relapse, you're still doing continue, It's a continuum of you doing the same behavior you, you've been doing anyway, the selfish behavior you've been stuck in. So, all right, so then let me ask you this Is it worth the anger that you feel and the unforgiveness and holding on to that thing? How valuable is that to you? Because I know you're going to be breaking up in groups here. I think this is something, you know, you, you, it's a perfect setting to deal with what I'm talking about. Anger used to be a form of medication. You use it as a rush. Literally, yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, it's almost like you can drink down bitterness just like you could a bottle of a Jack, you know. Uh, you know what I'm saying? You can medicate on that all day long. Look what they did to me. They say I'm a drunk. I'll show them. And we, you ever thrown a drunk at somebody? Or thrown a, you know, sling a drunk at them? You know, that gets them done. Well, I want to just say this: that forgiveness. I'm going to take the battle, and and, and the the uh, I'm going to take the uh, this uh, truth to the core of what we really need to be focused on, rather than the action of relapse. Uh, how many of you think that when the the chemical enters your body, that that's, that constitutes a relapse? Hmm? Okay. I'm gonna die. But that no, that's what we really think. But what if I forget about all that and I reckon that my relapse is my attitude? My relapse is is crack cocaine. My 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 uh, or my attitude is crack cocaine. My anger is is uh, heroin. My my anger is uh, you know alcohol. So when I'm when I'm in there and I got that window of time to open for relapse. If I take the battle to the preempted problem, I probably would never do the other. You see, in a heart that is pliable and forgiving and is turning his life back to and, and can, can freely forgive others, freely we receive and freely give, can do that. So it's important to get the unforgiveness out, the debt collecting out, so you can actually work a real program. Oh, there, I've been working a program. I want to tell you that if you have a habit of harboring and debt collecting and grudges, uh, you're missing it. And that's okay. God forgives you. Don't beat yourself up with that because you are welcome to the human race. Okay? It's a skill set. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to encourage you 
to, to take a little bit of what I'm talking about here. How do we take the, the, the relapse prevention to the attitude, not to the chemical? See, we kind of deify these chemicals, man. We deify. We, oh, if I, I just don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to use. And we make, I don't want to use. Uh, it kind of reminds me of uh, this guy we had, one of my employees, that uh, he came to see he had fallen into an affair with a lady. And, uh, and he cheated on his wife. And he came to us. We had him in a staff meeting. And we said, man, what happened? And he looked over at me and said, Larry, at least I didn't use. You cheated on your wife. I, I won't say what I, I really don't want it on tape what I said, okay? But it, it wasn't good. And, and, and I'm thinking, man, I'd much rather you go and get crap faced than, than cheat on your wife. You see? But we deify, we deify drugs and alcohol. We make it this all power. We say, well, I, 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 drugs are no more have the power over me. Yes, they do. If you're living in fear of a relapse, let me tell you what's happening to you. You do not believe the scripture that says, I reckon my old man dead, because he's still out there waiting for you. And unforgiveness will keep that sucker alive. Yeah, and to put to death those things. Well, I have guys, you know, we live in the mountains in the woods, so we're away in the tundra. And uh, guys, when they give their testimony to graduates, say, when I get back into the real world, I'm thinking, what universe are you from, man? You know? You're only 20 miles away from Walmart. <laughs> I mean, it's not like you. What, where do you think you are? You know, the real world. Well, here's the problem with it. Jesus said, "Come out from among them. Be you separate." I want to be just one of those different weirdo Jesus freaks, man. I'm sorry. That truly forgives myself. Stops holding God responsible for every little thing that I, I do. And. And I want to have the capacity to cancel your debt if you offend me. See, forgiveness is this. When Jesus was on the cross, how many of you have been taught to let us forgive us, pull your brother aside, go to him alone and talk to him? Remember that one? Mm -hmm. You know, when Jesus uh, uh, was on the cross, technically with our teaching, he should have looked down at those guys that have just crucified him and said, hey, hey, you guys, uh, I want to let you know I'm going to get right with you. I forgive you for this. Uh, you know, he didn't do that. He looked to the one who could punish them. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He went to the one that can actually devil out, dish out the punishment. He said, ah, hold back. Now, you know, whether you believe that he was forgiving them for that sin of killing him, you know, they went on to live later and maybe committed other sins that would have sent them to hell. I don't know, but I'm just saying for that situation, they were good. What about you? Do you have that level of forgiveness that you can not only let them go and cancel their debt? Because I forgive you. Oh, Lord, I forgive him. But, Lord, I know you're going to get him. Oh, Lord, I release him. I turn him over and turn his flesh over to you. We get all this spiritual BS that we got going on. You know, biblical hacking, I call it. You know, and, and the truth is, is our heart is bitter and we're unforgiving and we're hurt. And it's a quick fix. So the, the unjust rule, the unjust guy, that, the steward, that, that you know, God called him back in, or the master called him back in, right? And said, okay, pay up, right? And, and, he, and he went, though, and said, you know, God canceled his debt, so he went and started collecting from someone else. But remember his words, he said that, have compassion. All that I owe you, I'll pay you back. Remember that? Are you that kind of Christian that you're still trying to pay God back? You see what I'm saying? Are you still debt collecting? Because you'll go to others, and that's what he did. He went to his other fellow servants, started getting, oh, I'm going to get, he was collecting so he could go steal because he did not hear those words, your debt is canceled. That's why he behaved that way. And he, so he tried to do good, right? Let me show you some little bit of math here. If you take God out of the word good, you got zero. Hmm. It means nothing. God freely gives us the ability to make it a zero account. Not this residual cost. Well, what about interest? Uh, debt's canceled. It should make us giddy to forgive others. Yes, I forget to forgive them. I need joy in my life. 
and get rid of the bitterness. Starting with you. Amen? Amen. So, I hope this helps. I think we're going to do groups now. Is that right? I'm having good timing? Or? Okay. And uh, David wants to come up and say something. You want this headpiece? I'm going to take this home. This is really kind of clever. I'll be talking to y'all all the way from Georgia. Hey, down there in Florida. <laughs> All right, let's give Brother Larry a big hand tonight. Before we forget, we got a birthday in the house. Brother Rodney, why don't you stand up? Oh, 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 o